Thanks very much for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, the original actually feels a bit virtual today because uh, I just had uh, terrible things done to my eyes. So you all appear in triplicate. Now you may think that's a good idea, but um, <laughs> it's not necessarily so up, up my side of the eyesight. Um, but first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today. Um, I want to thank Hong Kong Watch Ben and all his colleagues for organizing this event. I'm delighted that we've got so, so many um, members of this hugely important diaspora with us today. I've been delighted a number of members of parliament. I'm not sure that I can see any members of the House of Lords. Yes? 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 And, oh, well, fine, that's fine. That's fine. Well, whatever, whatever happens, don't go back to the House of Lords because you might have to vote on the illegal migrants bill. So. <laughs> um, I've got an excuse. Um, just before saying one or two words about Hong Kong today and about uh, my feelings about the Hong Kong that was and the Hong Kong that is today, I just want to mention one person whose memorial service in Hong Kong that took place a few days ago. He was an absolutely wonderful example of public service, Michael Z, who was, uh, came from, um, to use a, what Ernest Berlin used to call a glitch. He was a cliche, came from an extremely humble background. He had, uh, I think there were eight siblings. Um, he went to Hong Kong U, he went into the civil service, was fast streamed and became eventually Secretary of the Civil Service and then went on the um, Trade and Development Council. And he was, a, he was a wonderful example of a Chinese patriot who understood what public service actually means. Um, there are some things that we left or should have left in larger measure in Hong Kong, institutional things. I think the most important things we left were what you call soft influences or soft power. And I think a number of uh, civil servants who were prepared to stand up to appalling pressure from the United Front, I think the number of civil servants who behaved with absolute honesty and integrity um, was perhaps one of the most important legacies uh, that we left uh, in, in Hong Kong. So I was thinking of Michael Z uh, today and yesterday, reading the order of service at his memorial service. A really wonderful human being, and he, he worked for me without any difficulty at all in coping with him, without, not without difficulty, without ever giving an inch to the United Front pro Beijing forces who were attacking him and his family. It's, of course, um, 25 years since we, I'm just doing my nothing of maths, mm -hmm. since we uh, left Hong Kong, and uh, also an anniversary of the security law. Um, perhaps I can say just a word or two about both. My, my biggest critic, some of you will recall, was Sir Percy Craddock, who had been British ambassador in Beijing. And when he disagreed with me, he used to say, the Chinese leadership, he said, may be thuggish dictators, but they're men of their word. And I just thought that time proved that at least part of that was true. And the first part, but not the second. Now, we left behind a system which was uh, established in an international treaty, broken by the Chinese as they've broken so many of their international treaties, and broken in a way which um, showed something which many of us have worried about um, over the years, that Hong Kong would prove to be the canary down the line. The way people behaved over Hong Kong and in Hong Kong would give us a pretty good idea of how they would behave 
internationally in relation to systems which they simply didn't understand or pretending not to understand. I think the two best uh, historians of modern China are Simon Lees, who, as you know, was the best translator of Confucius and was actually an Australian, uh, a Belgian Australian, and uh, Frank Dickinson. Both of them have argued passionately in their books that the Chinese Communist Party, and after all, that's what they're talking about, not China or the Chinese, that the Chinese Communist Party is incapable of reforming itself. And I think that's uh, manifestly true today. So faced in 2014 to 2019 and 20 with, with really the most extraordinary signs of the sentiment of people in Hong Kong, a China, Chinese leadership, Chinese dictator, how did Joe Biden get into so much trouble calling <laughs> Xi Jinping a dictator? <laughs> I mean, from the intellects of Confucius and from George Orwell, we know that we should call things what they are. Imagine even proud of So I, I think that it's questionable whether they really understood what Hong Kong's system was, one country, two systems. Well, um, what was the Hong Kong system? I remember trying to discuss with Lu Ping, quite a decent man, um, but an apparatchik, and a rather frightened apparatchik. I remember discussing with him. The difference between the rule of law and the rule of law. I was joking. What if they were the two same things? Anyway, we know how China is now reacting. China's Communist Party is now reacting. Regarding Hong Kong as an example of the values against which um, Xi Jinping told the cardinals and the party and government. They should engage with them in an intense struggle. In one reason why Hong Kong has been so battered and with comprehensive and vengeful restrictions on freedom of the press, on any development of civil society or democracy. The reason why Hong Kong has been so hit so hard is I think that it does um, represent the Chinese communists. An example of exactly what they think is the major threat to the communist system. At the moment, of course, a number of your friends and mine are suffering because of the political um, Jimmy Lai, for example, um, who I think I was, I was saying to Tom Chupinhead just now, I think the reason, the main reason why they can't stand him. It's not just that he criticized what happened. Of course, it didn't really happen in Tiananmen Square. Um, one of the, the other, re another reason is that he started that hugely successful uh, newspaper supporting democracy. But the other thing which I think annoys him even more is he stayed behind after the introduction of this. He had the bottle, he had the guts to stay behind because he believed in the freedoms, the values that had made Hong Kong such an extraordinary international city. One where my wife and my family and I were thrilled to spend five terrific years. Now, what happens now? As I've said to people before, most, um, uh -oh. I'll be very quick. The most difficult thing I get asked is whether people should go back. And uh, those are difficult decisions which I know really have to make. What I'm pleased about is that the British government reacted honourably about the PMO scheme and the right that they um, liberalised it. Uh, further, I hope they'll go even further in relation to students um, and young people. Uh, and uh, I think we do ourselves a huge favor because I think the Hong Kong diaspora is going to make an, an extraordinary value contribution to this country and already is. Um, uh, 
and uh, I don't think it'll be long before there's a Hong Kong Chinese Prime Minister of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Even if there isn't a uh, thing to just yet. Um, I want to finally just say how grateful I am to Hong Kong Watch for all that Hong Kong Watch does. It's very important that we keep what is happening in Hong Kong in the news. It's very important that we uh, keep a uh, close watch on what's happening in Hong Kong. It's very important that we raise it in every possible parliamentary forum around the world. It's very important that we call out the Chinese Communist Party when they behave, as you might expect from the acolytes of the big place. So thank you for all you're doing, and thank you for your contribution to Britain. And please support Hong Kong Watch in making sure that the world doesn't forget about it.